David Ahern, and I work for Cumulus, and want to talk about the L3 master device implementation that was put into the kernel. Uh, it's something that was accepted into the 4.4 kernel as a way of generalizing changes that we had put in for VRFs. It is a standalone API. It is something that can be leveraged by other uh, L3 drivers, such as the IPv LAN recently started using the receive hook on it. Um, in terms of its overall objective, uh, the intent is for it to influence FIB lookups, which is one of the primary things for layer three, and then give you access to packets at layer three. Uh, Implementation-wise, there is a kernel config option which enables the entire framework. If that config option is disabled, it completely compiles out, but you have to have it enabled if you want to see the VRF driver or now the IPv LAN driver. So like I said, the, the primary motivation behind the L3 master device is for VRFs. And for VRF, the intent is to create L3 domains. And the, the, the idea here is that you have a domain that goes with a table, so packets that are flowing through that domain would reference that FIB table for route lookups or source addressing or, or uh, um, source validation. Operationally, it's a, it's a mod the model is kind of following the bridging from the standpoint of associating an interface to an L3 domain you're going to enslave that interface to an L3 MDEV, an L3 master device. So like in the case of VRF, you associate, say, three front panel ports, enslave them to that VRF. As packets come in through that, that VRF, through those interfaces in that VRF, it goes to the table associated with it. And then as packets are going out, BGP, for example, sending out bound packets, it has a socket bound to the master device. So that tells the lookup to go to that FIB table. One of the key points of the L3 MDEV framework is that it only impacts layer three decisions, address resolution or you know, address selection or route lookups. So if you've got LLDP running on those same interfaces, it doesn't have any impact. LLDP will still see the interfaces and it'll still be able to send and receive packets over it with, without any impact to them. So L3 domain as a net device. Kind of like in, in the Unix world, everything is a file descriptor. When it comes to networking constructs, the net device is a core construct. So many things are anchored off of it, from QDIS, TC filters, net filter rules, uh, FIB rules. All these things leverage the fact, you know, are, are based on rather the, the presence of a network device, a net device structure. And we even have this, this ability with creating a net device for an L3 domain, now we have a place to anchor um, L3 domain local loopback addresses, which are something that's very important for L3 routing protocols. Uh, also by using uh, the net device construct, we can, we can leverage a lot of the existing code paths in the kernel. So for example, FIB rules that are based on OIF or IIF, um, socket APIs using socket binded device, so an application can specify which domain is of interest to it, and then the operational semantics. So when you create a VRF device or an L3 MDEV device, you get no NetDev notifiers going through the kernel. You get um, notifications to user space when it gets deleted and created, or created, deleted. Um, when you want to monitor what's going on, the existing IP link show commands will now list out L3 domains as well. So from an operational perspective, the user doesn't have to go learn any kind of new semantics. Everything you've done for bridging, everything you've done for existing interfaces, now just works for L3 domains as well. So like I said, the, the primary motivation here is FIB tables. And one of the operations is this L3 MDEV FIB table to return the table ID associated with that L3 MDEV device. It's called in the fast, fast path, and it really, since this Table ID is local to a device. You have to call an operation to do it. So you really want to store that in private data on the device. Uh, Route-wise, the, the FIB table that's associated with that L3 MDEV is expected to contain all the routes. So host routes, local routes, unicast routes, broadcast routes, all of it are going to be in that table that you've identified with the L3 MDEV. And then the host and connected routes are moved to that table when the link is brought up. 
And of course, additional routes can be added to any, any one of those FIB tables using BGP or um, statically adding routes. You put them into that FIB table and they become part of that L3 domains lookup. Again, from a policy routing perspective, by using the, an L3 master device, you can set up the FIB rules either per device or using an L3M dev rule, which is the target of that rule is to address the scalability issues of having to have multiple rules per device. With the L3M dev rule, you've got one rule for, that works for everything, for all L3M devs. And then when you hit, the, hit a match, it'll go look up, it'll use that, that uh, FIB table operation to go look up the, the, the table for that specific device and then direct the lookup to that table. So that's been a big help from scalability aspects of it. And then as a part of getting that match to work, you know, the flow struct gets set up through different parts of the, the, the networking stack and we have to flip the OIF or the IAF from either the ingress device or the socket that's been bound to a device. We have to flip that over to the L3M dev right before the lookup so that it can hit the FIB rule, so that it can go to the table associated with that device. So those are some of the, the APIs that have been put in, the L3M dev APIs that have been put in for a for FIB lookup perspective. From a network address perspective, uh, only devices within that L3 domain are considered when you're doing address selection. So when you do the route lookup, if the device itself has a, an address, that's the preferred one. Next, it'll look at the L3M dev itself to say, if it has an address, I'm gonna prefer that. And then it'll start looking at other interfaces that have been associated with the L3M dev. Uh, the kernel does not put link local addresses on an L3M dev device, and it does not insert multicast routes for those. It's not expected to, to, to work. And in fact, the VRF driver will specifically fail anytime any kind of lookup for a link local or multicast address because the, the operational semantics get kind of weird. So we just shut it down and only do link local addresses. I mean, yeah, link local and multicast addresses on the enslaved devices themselves. So user space API, again, because we've used this net device construct, um, we have existing POSIX APIs like the SO bind a device and the C message with IP packet info as a way for an application to specify what domain is of interest to it when it's sending a packet. And those, uh, those APIs provide ability for an application to determine which L3 domain it's a member of. So for example, if you've got a global TCP server and it has a child socket, which this syscontrol allows, uh, it has a child socket that gets bound to a specific domain, it can do a get sock opt on that FD to see which domain that packet or that socket's tied to, so we'll know which domain it's talking in and out of. Or it can use IP packet info to retrieve that for UDP and raw sockets. And for those cases, it's the original ingress device that gets saved and passed to, to the application. So uh, another aspect that L3M dev provides is the ability to hook packets at L3. So this is happening after some of the protocol verifications. So IPv4, IPv6 can do basic validation on the SKB that says, yep, the header's fine, checksum's fine, et cetera. And then it, it can be handed off to an L3M dev uh, driver if they've registered the receive hook for it. And this gives the, the driver a chance to do something to the packet. For example, uh, it could set the DST, it can run it through net filter hooks, it can do whatever it wants to do for layer three features, and then it returns and the DST input is invoked. The handler for the DST input handler is invoked. If the, if the L3M dev receive function returns null, then the stack assumes that that handler consumed the packet and no more processing is done on it. So to look at the VRF driver as an example of um, what can be done inside the receive hook. The VRF driver uses this as a way to flip the SKB dev to the VRF device, and that's needed because sockets are expected to be bound to the, the, the VRF device. So then we gotta make sure the, the SKB dev and the SKB IIF is set to that VRF device so that you get the socket match. 
And then it runs it through, the, the packet gets run through uh, the network taps. So if you're running TCP dump on, on a, uh, a VRF device, for example, you get to see packets flowing through any, of the any interfaces enslaved to the VRF device. For link, uh, IPv6 link addresses, I mentioned that you know, the VRF driver specifically shuts down lookups on that device itself. And it also has uh, some special handling is needed because you can't flip the OIF or IF in the flow struct. You have to actually go to that table because the, the device that you're looking at is very important in terms of resolving, um, resolving the route. And then lastly, it's the packets run through a net filter hook. Right now, it's just the, I think it's pre-routing pre hook is the only one it's done. It can easily add other net filter hooks as, as, interest, as people have interest. For now, we're not using rules on these hooks, but it is something that can be done from the driver. And then similarly on the TX path, there is a hook that allows you to get access to that packet as it's going down the stack. And the, the hook here is called from the, NFL, uh, the, from the IP and IP6 local out functions before it's gone through the NF hook, which calls DST output as its output handler, or OK function, I should say. So this gives the, the drivers an opportunity to do something with the packet again. And just like with the receive path, if you return null, the packet's dropped, and no more processing is done on it. As an example of what a driver can do in their output function, the VRF driver uses this as a way to set the DST on the SKB to its cache DST, which means its output function is going to send it right back to the VRF driver. So it gets to go down the stack a little bit, hits the DST output, kicks back over to the VRF driver for it to implement device-based features. For example, if someone's put uh, a QDIS on the VRF device or any kind of filtering rules, net filter rules, etc., and the same with the network taps, it goes down the stack inside the VRF driver, hits all these packet or hits all these device-based uh, features, and then jumps back or resets the DST, and then injects the packet back into the stack so it can go out the door like it was intended, the, the original code path. But really, this is a, a VRF device-specific goal of having um, device-based features that can be applied to the L3 domain as a whole. So a summary of the operations, there's the L3 MDEV FIB table, which is responsible for returning the, the table ID associated with that device. The receive and the output hooks, so you get access to the packet and the output and receive uh, the, the ingress and egress paths. And then handling IPv6 link scope addresses. From a flag's perspective, we are trying to be you know, cognizant, obviously, of performance. And we use these flags so master devices have the L3M dev master flag set. Slave and slave devices have the L3M dev slave flag set. And we use these flags as a way to kind of quickly determine is the, are any of the L3M dev hooks that are trying to reset the flow struct or to redirect the packets, is that particular path relevant for this device? Uh, from an overhead perspective, like I said before, if this kernel config is not enabled, the L3 MDEV code completely compiles out. So there's no impact on performance. When it is enabled, I have tried to be you know, very uh, uh, sensitive to any kind of performance overhead. So structuring the lookups so that most likely paths are hit first, using the flag checks as often as possible. But the L3 MDEV, by, by definition, means we do have some extra device lookups. We do have those flag checks. We do have the um, retrieving, if it's an enslaved device that's being operated on or, or being looked at in the packet, then you have to go pull the master device from it and then any kind of driver operation for that device. So there is a bit of overhead, um, but we have, I have tried to keep that uh, to, as, to as minimum as possible. And then, of course, with the VRF driver, I showed you a lot of processing that that driver is doing on packets. So certainly the overall performance impact is dictated by what the L3 MDEV driver is doing itself. So to give you an idea of what kind of overhead we're talking about, 
TCPRR, so request response packets with one byte payloads, is what really stresses that lookup path. Because the idea is to go as fast as possible in and out of the stack. You're not worried about mem copies or any kind of big payload that you're dealing with. So we're really stressing the FIB lookups and, and the, the network processing path of that. So I looked at three cases. The, the baseline is L3M dev completely compiled out. Next up would be the kernel config is enabled, but nothing's being used. So we've added the hooks, but we're not using the hooks. And then the last one is the L3M dev is compiled in, and we're going to configure a VRF so that we're actually activating these lookups. The lookups are, are you know, returning a master device, flipping the OIF, flipping over to uh, the L3M dev driver itself. But I don't want what's being done in the VRF module to um, prejudice the overall L3M dev API itself. So I went into the VRF module and I took out all the, all the processing that it does in the RX and the TX paths and just kept the FIB lookup influence since that's what kind of dominates the, the intent of the L3M dev API and what I'm looking at here from a performance perspective. So that's important when you look at the performance results because if you actually use the full VRF capability, the performance hit is a little bit higher. So using L3M dev compiled out as the baseline and then looking at relative to that, um, compiling it in and then activating it. Compiling it in, there's about 0.75 for IPv6, 0.66 uh, for IPv4. So there's a small impact to performance just enabling the, the, the kernel config. But then when you start activating those lookups, so the OIF or the IIF is actually an, an enslaved device or is actually an L3 master device, that performance hit climbs to about 1.7 to 2.0%, which fairly small overall, but there is a, a noticeable impact with you know, activating these hooks. I just want to clarify this while we're looking at these numbers. So you said that there's, you're testing the FIB lookup. Is the TCP request response benchmark making a new connection to every request response? Ah, uh, no. That's yeah, a good therefore, point. the route is cached in the socket and you're not testing lookups at all. Yes, that's a very good point. Uh, I what, what I would suggest instead that. is to packet blast a UDP unconnected socket out to a dummy device or something like yeah. that. Is that guarantees that there's a right. lookup every single... So it, it would hit it, it does hit it. You on, go through the VRF device path, I understand the, that. The TX path. Yes. The TX path, it is going to get hit, right? No. There's a sock, the, the, yes, the, the VRF device path that before desk output will get hit. Right. And similarly on input for the input RX hook. Right. But in both directions, but the, the route's going to route's gonna be cached because we'll do a pre demux on receive and we have the yes. route available on transmit. Yes. And... Actually, lower because he's not counting that cost, but normally it would count. Normally, we'd experience that cost. Yes, so I think your number will improve, is what David is saying, right? Because I, nope. I think Dave's saying it would actually be worse, it would be a lot be more of lookups. I, I, it's not even in the benchmark, the lookups aren't happening. The connect happens, and that's where the route gets looked up and cached into the socket, and that's it. That's the only fib lookup that happens at all for the whole benchmark. It's oh, it's the same connection. Yeah. It, but it is important to see if there's any influence upon the FIB lookup at all. Because th this is what I spent doing for two and a half years when I did the routing cache removal. And yeah. the, canoni the canonical benchmark is an unconnected UDP socket blasting out the dev dummy with a fixed ARP address right. entry attached. That's the way to do so this. So the, the, the receive and the... So the receive and the output functions are getting hit because those are before the DMUX, for example. So it is stressing that aspect of it from you know activating the the device lookup or the the master pulling out the master and looking up that operation, kicking it over, sends it right back. Right. All the device traversal, all the things right. going in the VRF device, rewriting addresses, whatever right. you do inside the device, yes, that's getting triggered for sure. Yes. So yeah, I, I guess I did overlook the fact that it's not doing the field lookups on everyone. Cool, just wanted to clarify. All right, 
It's Q&A. Any, any other questions? So are there any limitations on uh, what type of devices you can actually have enslaved? Like, can you have a, a VLAN device, for example? Yes. Okay, good. You can, uh, we've done VLAN, Bond, Mac VLAN, uh, bridges. Anything with an address can be enslaved to an L3 MDEV. Yes. Um, periodic, periodic, have you tested IPv6 auto configuration on this, and does it work? I have Question. not done auto configuration, no. The uh, source address selection limitations. Yes. <clears throat> Can you never choose a source address from anywhere else in the system? Like you couldn't have an address assigned to loopback and have? No. Never? No, period. and that was something out of NetDev uh, in Spain that uh, David uh, Lamparder noticed that the source address selection was wrong and we fixed that so that it only returns an address associated with devices inside the L3 domain. But sometimes you can assign like a root or loopback addresses right. that are so somewhere you, else in the system. Well, you would put those, for this case, you would put those on the L3 MDEV device itself. You'd have to move them to the M3 dev. Yes, I if see. you want that address to be considered on the source address. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? All right. I guess I sped up a little bit too much for the time slot. <laughs>